Hey everyone, welcome again to Mountain View Church at Home. My name is Jeremy, I'm the pastor at Mountain View. I'm filming at a park that my wife, Nicole, and our boys frequent. It's right near our house. We, we walk down here sometimes, and a couple of weeks ago, we walked down to let the boys play. And as we approached, we noticed a group of teenagers actually sitting down here where I'm standing, and they were smoking. And they quickly got their stuff together as we approached and they, they headed off and the smell that was left behind told us that they were smoking a little bit more than cigarettes. And my wife kind of exclaimed, I, I think they buried something in the gravel. And so I kind of looked around and kind of poked around with my foot to see if there was anything there. Uh, there wasn't, but I did find that one of them had left their backpack and it was open. And so I called to them, I said, hey, you left your bag and they, turned and one of the boys started walking back. Uh, as I pulled it up, I noticed that it was pretty fully unzipped and full disclosure, I took a peek and saw a little bit of paraphernalia and he could see that I kind of took a peek and he started to run. And uh, I just gave him the bag and Nicole, she was frustrated. She was like, why do they have to do that? You know, don't they know that this is a kid's park? Kids play here? Like, why do they gotta do that here? I don't know. Three days later, I'm listening to a podcast and the, in the podcast, the host was interviewing a teenage girl on her experience under COVID-19 and under the restrictions. And the, the young gal said, well, I'm actually kind of staying with my dad right now. I, I normally stay with my mom. The host said, well, why are you with your dad when you're normally at your mom? And the teenager began to explain a story that the, her six-year-old sister and was getting stir crazy and mom was getting stir crazy too. So mom decided, you know what, there's restrictions. The playground down the street is empty. So we're just gonna take sister over there and let her play. Well, as little sister was playing, she actually got stuck in the foot with a hypodermic needle. And mom being a mom just freaked out, took her to the hospital. Thankfully, there was no infection from the needle but because they went to the hospital and because of the COVID restrictions within their city, they had to go under quarantine. And so the older sister who hadn't been there, she's with dad. Now, maybe you're thinking, I'm explaining these stories uh, about playgrounds and you're thinking to yourself, I don't wanna know about that. You know, you're thinking, I just wanna take my kids to the playground. I want them to have fun. And I don't wanna know that people do drugs in playgrounds. You, you kind of probably would prefer to be in ignorance, ignorant bliss. Ignorant bliss is this statement in English culture where uh, the idea that we're, we're living in this world of, of comfort because we don't know about a lot of the darkness and evil and bad things of the world. And ignorant bliss, being in ignorant bliss means that we're ignorant to that stuff. We, we don't know about it. We have no idea about it. And we kind of like it that way. It's bliss. It's comforting and peaceful and joyful to just know about the happy things and not know about any of the difficult things. And sometimes wanting to know all the answers, wanting to know all the facts, all the knowledge, all the wisdom and knowledge of the world and getting it all can actually leave us kind of sad. Well, we're not the first ones to experience this. In fact, there's a man in the Bible named Solomon. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, he, he tells the story that he searched the world over for knowledge and wisdom. And that when he had searched and had all the knowledge and wisdom in the world, he was actually left in vexation and in sorrow. He was just sad because when he searched out for all the knowledge and wisdom in the world, there were things that he just didn't want to know about and weren't enjoyable things and that humanity's got a lot of dark parts of its existence. So maybe you're thinking, this is not an encouraging message, Jeremy. This isn't an encouraging sermon at all. Like, where do we go from here? Well, hold on. Don't leave yet. Stick with me. Because what we're going to find is as we unpack this passage in Ecclesiastes, Solomon's going to point us to some help, to some resolution. And so we're going to get there. So if you haven't grabbed it already, go ahead and grab your Bible. And we're going to open up to Ecclesiastes 1. Ecclesiastes 1. And in your Bible, if you've got a print Bible and you don't know how to look things up, 
That's okay, don't worry about it. Just go to the table of contents at the front of your Bible, and at the table of contents, it's gonna just give you a list of the books, 66 books in the Bible. Look for Ecclesiastes, and then just go to the page number. Ecclesiastes is typically somewhere right in the middle. You may find yourself drop into Proverbs, like I did there, and just turn to Ecclesiastes, because it's close by, just a little forward from Proverbs. All right, and if you don't have a print Bible, you can download a Bible app on your mobile device, on your phone, and then you can just look it up there, just type in Ecclesiastes. I know it's a difficult word to spell, but just part, put ECC and it'll get you there. Okay, and uh, we're gonna start at verse 12. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. I have applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Maybe you're wondering who's Solomon? You're new to church or you're just kind of checking out Christianity? Don't worry, I'll explain. Solomon was made king at a young age, and as a young king, he prayed and asked God for wisdom. And God was so impressed as, at his request for wisdom, instead of wealth, or power, vast kingdom, that God granted him his prayer request and gave him wisdom beyond what anyone had before or anyone had after. But God also granted him wealth and a vast kingdom. Solomon grew having great wisdom from God, but then he went on this pursuit to seek out not just wisdom and knowledge of everything related to God, but then searched the earth over, everything done under the sun, looking over humanity to find all the wisdom and knowledge of everything that took place. And then, at the end of his life, he writes kind of a memoir, Ecclesiastes, which is what we're studying in this series, Make It Count. If we only have today, let's make it count. All right, let's start unpacking this. I, I wanna begin in verse 13. Solomon says that throughout his life, he set out to seek and search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven, the earth. And then he, he adds that he has now seen everything that is done under the sun and it is all vanity and striving after the wind. Well, what does this word vanity mean? Well, last week we talked about it, but if you didn't catch that, it's okay, I'll explain it quickly. It, we think about vanity in this idea of pride and, or, or maybe like a selfishness or a, a self-righteousness from our uh, maybe possessions or looks and, and, and vain, uh, a vain attitude and and we'd be right that is one definition that we have but if you were to look it up in the Oxford Dictionary there's actually a secondary definition that's actually pointing more to the biblical definition and it's an idea that vanity also means meaninglessness or futility in the biblical word for vanity it actually stems from the Hebrew word Havel that means vapor a mist, uh, kind of the picture here in the Yukon, when we exhale in the winter and that breath comes out of our mouth, we see it and then it's gone. It just kind of disappears. And this is what Solomon is pointing to as he searched for all the knowledge, for searching for everything all over the earth and to try to acquire as much wisdom and knowledge. He's saying it's, it's vanity, it's futile, that at the end of his life, in light of eternity, it's, it's like a vapor. I acquired it all and now it's gone. It's vanity, meaningless, futile. And then he says, what is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be counted. And this is, as he looks at the world, he says, you know, some things are just crooked. You know, some things are just out of place. Um, one author, Philip Ryken, writes this. Some things in life are crooked, not in the sense that they are criminal or immoral, but in the sense that they are so bent out of shape that they resist all our efforts to make them straight. Disease, disability, our own moral failings, the accidents we cause, and the list goes on. 
There is always something in life we wish we could bend back into shape. And sometimes our efforts to do so actually end up making things worse. You know, if I think about Solomon's statement here that some things are just crooked and you just can't get them back into shape. And you know, when I read that list of things that that Riken points out, you know, disease, disability, moral failings, accidents, just, like we have that going on now. And, and I think about the whole COVID-19 reality that we're in and, and everyone's trying to come up with ideas on how to fix it. And, you know, we, we think, okay, if we get a vaccine, then it'll all be fine. Or, but now, now the financial problems, maybe we do need to let people go back to work. And, and, and it feels like, I don't know for you, but it feels like we all have ideas on how we could fix this, but it's just crooked. It's just, it's a disease, it's a virus, it's an illness, and and we can't seem to get on top of it. No matter how much we we try to make plans and policies and and give our opinions, we're trying to like bend it straight again. Can't we just go back to normal life? Can't everything just go back to the way it was? Just life was straight and perfect, and and I just want to get back there. And Solomon's like, you know, life's crooked. There's been viruses and diseases before, and humanity tries our best to straighten it out. You know, there's going to be another virus or disease. There's, there's going to be more accidents. There's going to be more moral failings. We're, we're not always going to get it right. And we're going to try and try and try to get it straight. And sometimes life's just crooked. Now I want to scroll down to verse 18 for a moment. And he says, For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. This is kind of what we talked about over by the park as he's gained everything, you know, gained all his wisdom, it's vexation, it's a struggle in his heart, and and as he increased in all the knowledge in the world, he's in sorrow, he's sad, and this kind of sums up his whole pursuit for knowledge. (laughs) One author in Moody Bible Commentary writes it this way, he maintained that even the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge is frustrating and futile because it only brings greater grief and pain search for meaning always led to meaninglessness and an inability to truly understand life under the sun except for its troubles and sorrows riken from why everything matters the gospel ecclesiastes he adds relating to this verse then he offered another proverb to encapsulate what he had discovered for in much wisdom is much vexation and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow this is why people say that ignorance is bliss the more we know about life, the more sorrows we have. Increasing in knowledge and that knowledge leading to sorrow is not a new concept. Not even for Solomon's day. We actually first see it way back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. You see, Adam and Eve, the first two people on earth, they, they were kind of in a sense in ignorant bliss. They were in perfection, this wonderful, beautiful creation in communion with God. Life was perfect. And it's interesting, when Satan comes to tempt them before the fall, the things that he says really point to what Solomon's talking about. Satan came to them and said, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, comma, knowing good and evil. Isn't that interesting? That's, that's how Satan tempts them. You want to know everything? You want to know everything God knows? You want all the details? just eat of this fruit. I know God told you not to eat of it. I know that that this would be disobedience. Yeah, but you know, God just doesn't want you to become like him. Go ahead. In verse 7, it says, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. In verse 8, it says they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Then in verse 11, it says, God finds them and says and asks who told you that you were naked have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat you see from that moment sin entered the world darkness disobedience deception disease and death it entered the world and every single one of us every single one of us has inherited it we all every one of us born sinful and it's hard to think about for you know some of you moms out there maybe like Nicole who who just deeply desire and want to protect you know your kids that 
that mama bear instinct it's it's a great thing it's a beautiful thing and 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 us dads we want to protect our kids from from the evils of the world and and we just think of them as perfect you know when they're born they they look perfect and and, and we just we pray and wish that you know they they won't have to face the darkness of the world and as they grow influences come in and we we try to shelter them and protect them and and it almost becomes fleeting because somewhere around 12 years old we start losing control we can't control them anymore they're pushing boundaries and then the teenage years boundaries really get pushed and they start doing things that we never wanted our kids to do they start asking things learning about things finding out about things doing things that that we don't want them to do we we want to shelter them from it but in that kind of 12 year old realm somewhere along there we we move from control to influence and and we we can influence their life but we we, we start to to lose the ability to to block them in or to to hide them from things and it hurts it really burdens us whether you're a mom, a dad, grandparent, aunt, uncle, or maybe you, you're just really close to a family and there's kids that you love and you want to protect them and you don't want them to know all that stuff. Like the playground. You don't want to know what happens after hours at a playground. You don't want to know that people do drugs in a playground. Is that really a thing? That can't be a thing. I don't want to know that. So what do we do? Are we really going to either strive for knowledge or strive to block everything out can we do that is that possible i think if we think about just today if you only had today how would you make it count if today was the only day that you could maybe push back the darkness and 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 maybe block out the evil things of the world you know how would you do it how would you protect your kids how would you protect the kids of the world and I think the influence is important. As Solomon closes this, as Solomon does all the way through Ecclesiastes, we're always left hanging. It's like we're on a cliff. And, and he doesn't really resolve the problem. He kind of actually just gives us bad news with a ton of questions. We need to remember that Jesus finishes the story that Solomon started. I'm going to say that again. Jesus finishes the story that Solomon started. Jesus taught whoever would save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels the good news of Jesus will save it for what does it profit a man to gain the world and forfeit his soul this is the point where we need to ask ourselves are we striving for earthly wisdom and knowledge or are we striving for eternal wisdom and knowledge Jesus gives us a great picture that that he wasn't focused on the the earth the the world's knowledge and wisdom he he had a plan that was past it just think about who he chose as his disciples again maybe you're new to Christianity let me explain but but Jesus could have as a rabbi he could have went to the temple where the the most the smartest minds gathered there that he could have chose disciples there students there that were knowledgeable and and had great and vast wisdom of the old testament scriptures he could have done that he was god fully man fully god jesus could have done that he could have chose them and they would have went with him but he didn't the first crew that he picks out is fishermen and fishermen at that time this is like a lowly tradesman it, low on the totem pole of kind of economy and social status and and wealth and power and especially knowledge and wisdom no one ever went to the docks looking for a fisherman to to find out you know what's what about the world and yet he went to them they were shocked probably as the rest of the world was shocked but then he chooses like a tax collector who at that time is considered a cheat and no one likes tax collectors raising money for the Roman Empire and then he also he chooses a zealot which is like someone who wants to overthrow the Roman Empire kind of a rebel this this anarchist and chooses him think about everyone that Jesus chose as his disciples it's a very clear picture that he was not pursuing the the people with the most vast knowledge and wisdom Jesus is always focused on the heart and this is where Jesus finishes the story it doesn't matter 
whether or not <laughs> you have vast wisdom or knowledge or not. It, it doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter who you are. It, it doesn't matter what you know. And, and maybe you, you've had a sheltered life and, and just by God's grace, you haven't experienced a lot of the dark things in the world. But on the other end, maybe you have experienced a lot of the darkness of the world. Maybe you've experienced depression, suicide, abuse, substance abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Maybe you've experienced crimes, theft, murder. I don't know. I don't know your background, but God does. And here's the craziest part about Jesus. He forgives you. God forgives you. Jesus took every one of those pieces of darkness took the sin of the world on his shoulders at the cross and he paid the debt the debt owing for all the suffering all the pain and the darkness all the things we don't ever want to know about he took it to the cross and paid for it he took the punishment for it and he died and was buried but God's plan wasn't over and three days later he rose from the dead he conquered sin conquered death disease darkness he conquered it all to make a way that anyone who would believe in him and accept his forgiveness would enter into heaven and here's the beautiful thing heaven's back to ignorant bliss in heaven there, there's no disease there's no sadness there's no darkness we're back to a picture of what Adam and Eve started with before the fall, before they were tempted to sin, and before we all were tempted to sin and fell. That's what Jesus was looking towards. That's what he wanted for all of us. That's where he was moving towards. Now, I'm not saying that you can't learn things. I'm not saying you don't seek wisdom or knowledge. I, I think that's a great thing. But in our journey to seek wisdom and knowledge, we're going to learn a lot of stuff that maybe we didn't want to know about. History's full of really dark stuff. But just remember that this earth fades. This story is not over. And you have a choice today. Today you can make it count. A at the end of your life, or when Jesus returns as he promised, in that moment, will you lean on yourself or lean on him? If he came back today, if you faced eternity today, do you know for sure that you know Jesus, that you've accepted his forgiveness, that all the darkness that you've experienced, that he's taken it at the cross. I'm gonna pray right now and you have a moment. If you would like to give your life to Jesus today, you can pray with me. You can make today count. And you can choose to not be just left in sorrow and vexation, but that you can be left in joy. Father in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner. I've got darkness in my heart. I've seen darkness, witnessed darkness. and There's so many things I wish I didn't know. There's so many things I wish I hadn't have done. But today I choose to accept your forgiveness for all of that. I believe that Jesus took it on the cross and that he conquered it in his resurrection from the dead, conquering death and sin. And that I today choose to believe in him and believe in your gospel plan I accept forgiveness and that I choose to follow Jesus. Please send your Holy Spirit into my life, that promise, that seal, that someday I will be in eternity with you, where there will be no pain, no disease, no darkness, no evil things, no sad things, no sorrow, no vexation. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, before you go, just a couple quick little updates. Now, first, the way we can get the message of Jesus and Mountain View Church's message out to our city, our territory, and the world is through sharing. Uh, please consider liking, commenting, sharing this, this message to whoever you know. And we're trying to create an invitation culture, and you can help with that. We can only get these video, videos out so far. But each of you has a social network, a network of people in your email list. And so think about, pray about, who needs to know this message? Who could I invite to watch this message? Well, have an amazing day, and thanks so much for taking part in Mountain View Church at home.